I didn't mean to cry, really. I didn't. It's just that I'm so happy to see you. I could it's die. All right. It's all right, oh, Ro. Everything's all right. It's baby. No, damn. <laughs> Oh, damn, I mean, I meant to carry this over with a smile and a martini and... Don't oh, martini's a, a scrumptious idea, isn't it? That's a fine idea, Ro. Come on. Well, now, let's have a look at you. Oh, what? Madeline's coming home for Christmas, you know, and, uh... Well, not having a maid, I decided to get the tree early and, uh... Turn the damn thing up myself. Well, say something, Fog. These captain's inspections are giving me the whim whams. What do you think of the old hulk, huh? You look absolutely marvelous. Oh, oh I knew you could say that. Oh, and look at you. You're so smart. Oh, a few new gray hairs, you old thing. Very attractive. Ooh, that feels good. How about that drink now? I could use one. Now I better call Digger first, find out why I'm on class one priority. Oh, Digger will only tell you to call the White House. Now why don't you White sit... House? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, Lucy Brown will have my head. She swore me to secrecy. I, I just assumed you knew, and so assumed I... Assumed I knew what? Rhoda, exactly what did she tell you and when? Dear, well, well, it, it seems that the White House ordered Bupers to get you back here, PDQ. Now, this was sometime in November before, well, before you lost to Northampton. That's all I know. Uh, but that's all Digger knows. Oh, can't it wait? Why don't you go make the drinks, honey? Well, just don't let on that Lucy told me. I mean, she will roast me over a slow fire. I'm supposed to meet the president at noon tomorrow. The president? Oh, Pug. Well, I must say, you don't look very happy about it. The last time I visited the White House, you know, it damn near wrecked my career. Oh, I know, but that was in law. On my stop in Pearl, I was summoned by Admiral Spruance. He is now Nimitz's chief of staff. I thought I'd get hell for losing my ship. I figured my career was finished. Never. Well, evidently, they thought I must have done something right in that battle. Spruance wants me for his operations officer. Nimitz put in the request. Oh, God. What is it, Ro? I'm, I'm very happy for you, Pug. It's just that I was hoping maybe you would get to be the president's naval aide. Well, that was Lucy Brown's guess. And... Then at least we get to see something of each other a while. Yes, that would be nice. Sure would. It's good. Do you want to talk about the Northampton pug? We got torpedoed and we sank. Poor Alastair Tudsbury. I was flattened when I read about it in the newspaper. Yes, that was a shock. Damn pity. But at least old Tucky died with his boots on. I wonder what Pamela will do now. I saw them when they passed through Hollywood. Yes, I got your letter. You know, she told me she actually wrote some of his speeches. Yeah, she was ghosting quite a bit of his stuff there toward the end. Now, how about that dinner? Yeah. 
Yes, the dinner. I think that's enough wine, dear. Negative. This is my homecoming. I'm celebrating. Now, where was I? Well, you were telling me about New Caledonia, where you took the Northampton after Midway. Oh, right, right. Yeah, madhouse. All those fussy French colonialists overrun by American war making. Halsey's running the whole damn South Pacific campaign from Numea. There's a few Navy nurses, some French girls, and they're surrounded four deep by colonels and captains. The lieutenant hasn't got a look in. Warren didn't like that. Yeah, we're sitting in the bar at this musty French hotel, and Warren leans in, you know, with that grin, and he says, uh, Dad, what these girls are forgetting, when the uniform comes off, the more stripes, the less action. <laughs> Only war in our own. I'm afraid you're not making much sense, dear. What? Well, you just said you and Warren were together, and he cracked a joke. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess I could do with some coffee. I don't think coffee will help much, dear. No? I just discourage you. Oh, <laughs> sweetie pie. I love you to little pieces, but I just don't think you could make it. Come on, come on. One good night's sleep, and the tiger will be back on the prowl. It's good to have you back. Sorry about this. He's forgiven me. But he hasn't even begun to forget. The question is, is it salvageable? I think it is. Oh, no, it wasn't such a bad first day. Father will let us know when he's ready for us. Admiral Leahy and Mr. Hopkins are in there with him now. Admiral, did Bupers notify you that Admiral Nimitz wants me as his deputy chief of staff? Well, uh, yes. Yes, they did. Then the president knows about it, too. Fog, my advice to you is to go in there and simply listen when summoned. Okay. Thank you. It's a bad situation, Harry, but Mr. we're Mr. President, to yeah. Captain Victor Henry. Whoa, puddle boy. Mr. President? Oh, the Japs made you swim for it, did they? I'm afraid so, sir. My favorite exercise, you know, swimming. Good for my health. But I like to pick my own time and place. <laughs> uh, you remember Harry. Hug. And I'm sure you must know our head of Joint Chiefs, Admiral Lee. Yes, sir. Pug, I regret the loss of that grand ship and all those brave men. The Northampton gave a fine account of herself, I know that. 
I'm glad you got away safe. Thank you, sir. Tell me something, Henry. Exactly what happened out there off of Tassiferanga? I've been reviewing the records. We found ourselves in torpedo water, sir, after opening fire at 12,000 yards. We did have intelligence, Mr. President, that the Japs were building a remarkably long-legged torpedo. Tassiferanga confirmed it. Notice that you uh, mentioned those torpedoes in the conference before the battle, Henry, and suggested commencing firing at longer range. Yes, sir. It's too bad someone didn't listen, Bill. Why do you suppose that was? We're looking into it, Mr. President. Care to comment on that, Henry? No, sir. Well, as said, Mr. President, it's being looked into. Well, thanks for your time, Chief. I'll send you a written summary of next week's agenda this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Henry. Yes, sir. Uh, sit down, Pug. Pug, uh, when I got word from Sec Nav about your boy Warren, I felt terrible. Is Rhoda bearing up? Yes, sir, she is. That was a remarkable victory at Midway. And it was all due to brave youngsters like Warren. They saved our situation in the Pacific. <clears throat> you know, Pug, we ran into a heck of a shortage of landing craft for North Africa. Now, there was talk of a crash program to turn them out, and your name came up. One forceful man riding herd on that problem for the Navy is what I need. However, quite by coincidence, something else has come along. You remember old Bill Stanley? I've made him my ambassador to Moscow. Yes, sir, I heard that. Well, he's been singing your praises ever since you went over there with him last year on that Harriman mission. He wants you back in Russia, Pug. Ask for you as a special military aide. Do you have a preference? Well, Mr. President, this goes to my head a bit, being offered such a choice, and by you. That's most of what I do, old fella. I just sit here, sort of a traffic cop, trying to direct the right men to the right jobs. Well, you've got to take 10 days leave first, in any case. Show Rhoda a good time. That's an order. Then get in touch with Russ Carton, and one way or another, we'll put you to work. Yes, sir. I'll do that. By the way, how's your submariner? Doing very well, sir. And his wife, that Jewish girl who was having difficulties in Italy? She's, uh, she's all right, sir. Thank you. This Jewish situation is simply awful. I'm at my wit's end about it. The only answer is to smash Nazi Germany as soon as possible and give the Germans a beating they'll remember for generations. We're trying. So long, Pug. Thank you, sir. Hello, Foxy. Slope, you made it. Good to see you. Where'd you shoot that thing, Siberia? <laughs> it's just about. Well, here it is. Good. Now, you take a look at this. What is this? You're just in time. Joint United Nations statement on German atrocities against Jews. Foxy, what is this? A keg of dynamite, that's what. A hell of a breakthrough. Official, approved. Ready to go for simultaneous release in Moscow, London, and Washington. Maybe as soon as tomorrow. When Tunnel cabled us about the stuff you were bringing, it gave us a lot of leverage. Who made these cuts? They castrate the thing. Les, that's a very strong document. Look, don't give me that. Look, if we don't say our government believes that the Germans are committing genocide against the Jews, if we don't talk about the wholesale extermination of women and children, then who cares? Then it's just about Jews, far-off bearded kikes. 
Les, that's an overwrought emotional reaction. Now, you're tired. You're damn right I'm tired. You know, I have just come 5,000 miles with these documents. Now, I want to know who made these cuts. They came from the second floor. Here. Breckenridge Long. The president's dear old friend. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, he's champing at the bit to see you. Why? Ask him. You have an appointment with him in 10 minutes. Well, Leslie Slot. We should have met a long time ago. Tell me, how's your father? My father? Uh, he's, he's fine. I wasn't aware you were acquainted. <laughs> well, I haven't seen him since our days at Princeton. But uh, he and I used to just about run the Ivy Club. Tennis, sailing, getting in trouble with girls. <laughs> now, how did Timmy Sloat's boy ever happen to go to a tin pot school like Yale? Why didn't your father put his foot down about Princeton? <laughs> Please. Yeah. Well, despite that handicap, you have made an admirable foreign affairs officer. Oh, I know your, your record. <laughs> Thank you. The fact of the matter is, uh, that's why I wanted to see you. I need help. A special kind of help. You do. Indeed, yes. Uh, somebody in the Division of European Affairs should be disposing of Jewish matters and not passing them on to me. And I think that Timmy Sloat's boy is the man for the job. And your reputation, being a sympathizer with the Jews, is a wonderful asset. Sir, Breck. Breck. Yes. I, I don't want to be placed in such a position unless I can really do something to help the people who come to me. Of course. That's what I'd want you to do. But the existing regulations make that almost impossible. Oh. Come on, tell me. The visa requirements, for example. How in the name of God are German Jews supposed to get a good conduct certification from the local police? The local police is the Gestapo. Leslie, these are standard rules devised to keep out criminals, uh, illegal fugitives, uh, men of the riffraff. You know. Nobody has a God-given right to enter the United States. Oh, it's, it's agreed, agreed. But there are ways around all that. If we look for them. Yes. Yes, you're probably right, yeah. I'm not big-headed. Yeah. And I'm not an anti-Semite. Despite all the smears in the press, hopefully our joint statement will go some distance to silence or that kind of thing. Uh, have you had a chance to look at it? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I have, and Breck, if I may speak candidly. Oh, please, please. I'm terribly concerned about the deletions in that statement. Oh, as am I, Leslie, as am I. But try to understand. I am not entirely my own man here. You see, uh, uh, Anthony Eden drew up that plan. And, and between the Russians and the British, we've been going round and round and for God's sakes, that we could get anything through at all. It's a miracle. Yes. Yes, I'm sure it was. Uh, Leslie.
I truly believe we must help the unfortunate Jewish race in their time of agony, whenever, wherever we can. Within the law, I need your help. Will you help me? I'll try, sir. I'll try. Colonel Peters. Do you know him? Oh, yes, he's a fine man. I met him at church. Where on earth did he find that chorus girl? Oh. Well, what do you say? Shall we join them? Suits me. Oh, I don't know. Can I trust you at the same table with that blonde floozy? Come on. <laughs> Mrs. Henry, nice seeing you again. Colonel Peters, uh, my husband, Captain Henry, Colonel Peters. Oh, Colonel. Captain, uh, Susan Wiley, Captain, and Mrs. Henry. Susan. Pleasure meeting you. Miss Wiley. General, how are you? It's good to see you. Uh, how do you think the war is going? Where? All over. How does the Navy see it? That depends upon where you sit in the Navy. Well, then from where you're sitting. I see plenty of hell behind us and plenty ahead. Concur. And that's a better year-end summary than I've read in all of the newspapers. It's almost midnight, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me, Mrs. Henry. Oh, fuck. Happy New Year, Rhoda. Everybody, it's almost time. Why don't we all count together? And hit.
This will be a better one. Let's hope so, though. Let's hope so. Sorry to hear about the Northampton. Oh. Uh, I was just checking to see how we did with our joint United Nations statement. Oh, about the atrocities. Oh, you mean you actually found it? Buried on page 10 of the Washington Post. Yeah. They didn't give it much of a play, did they? <laughs> well, I shouldn't be surprised, I guess. Ah, oh, thank you. But still. If the three powers agree on anything and then commit it to paper, you'd think it'd be worth some notice. At least the New York Times put it on the front page. Under the item about gas rationing, of course. Oh. By the way, uh, have you seen this? No, I haven't. That was too bad about talking. Yeah. Leslie. Oh, how good to see you. Pleasure to see you again. Oh, this is our daughter, Madeline. Madeline, Thank Leslie you. Sloat, very good friend of Byron's and Natalie's. Pleasure to meet you. I've heard a great deal about you. Again, thank you for inviting me. A bachelor's can always use a home-cooked meal. Oh, don't be silly. <laughs> oh, time? Oh, yeah. It's about Tusbury. Oh, so awful. Oh, bless me. Pamela's coming here. And she's engaged to Lord Burnwilk. Did you know that, Pug? No, I didn't. Well, she's done very well for herself, hasn't she? I remember when I met her. Lord Burnwilk was there, too. The blonde dreamboat with the beautiful accent. Yes, indeed. It was my dinner party for the Bundles for Britain concert. Burnwilk is an outstanding man. Dad, his lordship is unforgettable. RAF blues, campaign stars, and all those ribbons. Kind of like a stern Leslie Howard. That's sort of a screwy match, though, isn't it? He's as old as you are, and she's about my age. Oh, Madeline. She's much older than that. So, are there any news of Natalie? Actually, there's a lot to tell. Madeline, let's get dinner on. We'll talk at the table. Why Lourdes? Why were they interned there? We don't really know. But we are sure that the Vichy government put them exactly where the Germans wanted them. Well, then can't the Germans take them whenever they feel like it with their uncle and the baby and just ship them off to some ghastly camp? Oh, Madeline. No, no. That is the problem, exactly. And we just have to hope that it doesn't happen. I report back to the White House in a couple of days, Leslie. Is there something I can do for Natalie? Actually, that's what I want to talk to you about. Do you still have your contact with Harry Hopkins? Well, he still calls me Pug. All right, then. There was no point in alarming you before, but the fact is their positions become extremely precarious. We're no longer dealing with the French for this group. The Germans have taken over the negotiation. How come? 
They're trying to include in the swamp a, a, a whole swarm of agents from North Africa and South America. See, with the Germans involved, this enormously heightens Natalie's danger. What can the White House do? Get her out of Lourdes. How? Through our people in Spain. See, the Spanish border isn't 40 miles away. Informal, quiet deals can be made. Sometimes indirectly, even with the Gestapo. I'm not saying this will work. I'm saying we better try it. But how? I know who to talk to at State. I know where the cable should go. A phone call from Harry Hopkins will enable us to move. Look, I don't want to sound frantic, but I, I, I just I urge you to try this. If this war goes on two more years, every Jew in Europe will be dead. Natalie's no journalist. Her, her documents are fraudulent. The documents break down. She's gone. The baby, too. This is the time to cash in whatever credit you have at the White House. Just try to get Natalie out of Lourdes. seeing me, sir. Always a pleasure. I'll be going, Mr. Hopkins. Have a seat. A little historical trivia for you. Do you realize that it was in this room that Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation? No, sir, I didn't. Well, this is where he did it. <laughs> There's a real coincidence. I've been meaning to get in touch with you. You been giving any more thought to our landing craft problem? Yes, sir, I have been thinking about it. Uh -huh. Well, I hope you're going to sign on for it. You lick this one, Pug, you'd be a hero. Also be an admiral pretty soon. Actually, sir, I haven't made any decisions yet. Hmm. What I'm really here to see you about is my daughter-in-law. Uh, so that's uh, still a problem, then, I take it. Yes, sir. She and the baby and her uncle, Dr. Jastrow, are with the American attorneys in Lourdes. As you know, sir, they're Jews. I was hoping that something might be done to get them out of there ahead of the others. Lourdes, huh? OK, let me take a look at that. Uh, this is Hopkins. Oh, hello, Mr. President. Right away. Uh, by the way, sir, uh, Pug Henry is here. Yes, of course, sir. Boss wants to say hi to you, Pug. Follow me. Another 30 seconds, sir. It's been in long enough. Well, Pug, how are you? Very well, sir. Did you and Rhoda have a nice New Year's? Yes, Mr. President, thank good, you. Good, good. Now, what were you and Harry cooking up just now? Where do you go next, Moscow or landing craft czar? Mr. President, Admiral Nimitz has requested my services as Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations. Oh, I see. Really? Well, I suppose that's where you'll go, then. I certainly wouldn't blame you for that. The Pacific is your ocean. It's a grand assignment. All the luck. Oh, Art. Yes, Mr. President. Bring that report. I want to go over it with you again. 
Here you are, sir. You see, up here, this uh, and this don't drive. I think it requires a bit more research. And, uh, requires uh, you have to check on that. They don't jive. Mr. President, I am always yours to command. Well, Pug, it's just that Admiral Stanley feels sure he could use you in Moscow. I had another cable about you from him only yesterday. We're fighting a very big war, you know, Pug. There's never been anything like it. The Russians are very difficult allies, heaven knows. Perfectly impossible to deal with sometimes. But they're tying down three and a half million German soldiers. And we can't afford to have Stalin thinking of negotiating a separate peace with Hitler. So, if you can help out in Russia, and my man on the spot seems to think so, why, maybe that's where you should be. Aye, sir. In that case, I'll go from here to Bureau of Personnel and request those orders. Good luck, Pug. Thank you, Mr. President. So long, Pug. It'll mean at least a year, won't it, Pug? It'll be a long time. So hoping for Washington. It's what the president wants, Ro. Hmm. The president. We certainly come a long way, haven't we, Pat? <laughs> you remember the night you proposed? No, it was too long ago. Oh, don't give me that, you old thing. <laughs> Honestly, Pat. You went on and on about how awful it was to be a Navy wife. And you know something? You were absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to let you know what you were getting yourself into. I know, but really, Pug, at one point I thought you were trying to talk me out of it. And I said to myself, fat chance, mister, you're hooked. This is your idea. Oh. We've had a lovely couple of weeks, haven't we? Yes, we have. Too bad you have to leave tomorrow. You'll miss Byron. He'll be here in a couple of days. Yeah, I don't like that part. You miss Pamela Tutsbury, too. Yes, I'll miss Pamela Tutsbury, too. Well, if you can stand it, I've made an apple pie. Ooh, I won't get that in Moscow, will I?
Good morning, sir. May I take your breakfast order? Yes, please. I'd like ham and eggs and pancakes. Dear Pug, you pleased the boss greatly the other morning, and he'll remember it. He knows what the Nimitz post meant to you. Now, about that special request for your daughter-in-law. We sent out the feelers, but I'm afraid the Germans queered the effort. It seems they're in the process of moving the internees to another location. Exactly where, we don't know yet. But I don't want you to worry, Pug. Sumner Wells says that he truly believes they're in no hazard, and that negotiations for exchanging the whole crowd are well along. Good luck in Moscow, Harry. All's well, don't worry.
city's Baden-Baden waters work wonders. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be quartered at the Brenner's Park here until the exchange takes place, which uh, negotiations are still in progress. Now, I'd like to present to you our Swiss liaison officer, Mr. Henri Boulle. Good afternoon. Intense diplomatic efforts are indeed proceeding to speed the exchange. Meantime, your welfare is now the responsibility of the German government. My government, by agreement of all parties, is directly interested. My instructions are to make sure you are well and comfortable at all times and receive every courtesy and good treatment possible in war time. And now Dr. Kurt Friedrich of the German Foreign Ministry. Welcome to Germany. You are asked to place your package on the tables provided for inspection. All shortwave radios will be confiscated. You will be allowed to listen to German radio, and you will have German newspapers and magazines. After package inspection, and you have been shown your rooms, Lunch will be served in the main dining room. I wish you a pleasant stay in beautiful Baden Baden. Yeah, I think. I'm not sure exactly you might be. This hotel once had a reputation for its cookery. <laughs> Professor Aaron Yastra, author of A Jews Jesus, I believe? Yes, indeed, Dr. Friedrich. Professor, may I say, I am a long-time admirer of yours. Your book should be required reading for all aspiring theologians. Jesus the men volks in the pages. I am honored to serve as your host. I've not been translated into German. I thought I'd be quite unknown here. Come, come, Professor. Your name on the roster might as well have been in electric lights. Oh, I see. The top floor suite you and your niece have been assigned. With the fine river view, is it adequate? Oh, perfectly. Indeed, quite luxurious. And you and your baby, Mrs. Henry. You're comfortable? Yes, thank you. Good. It's the hotel's best accommodation. When you're settled in, sir, perhaps you and I can chat and discuss your work and literature in general. I'm a lover of serious history. Of course, I shall be perfectly at your disposal. know who we are. And that'll be 80 cents. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Have you been? OK. 
okay? Let me look at you. You're becoming more like Warren. I'll never be like Warren. Come on. This is a nice little place. Well, it's all Vic and I really need. The spare bedroom's yours, Brian. As long as you're here and whenever you're in port. That'll be great. Dad told me in his last letter you found Natalie. Is there any news? Yeah, I, uh, I talked to Sloat when I was in Washington. She's in Germany. Germany? Listen, I I'll tell you all about it after I see Vic. Where is he? In the kitchen. Come on. Great to see you. All I can say is about time. Welcome back. Thanks. Where'd the little sign come from? Al Halsey's got it hanging over his HQ in the Solomons. That's our religion these days. So how do you like the moray so far? Pretty sweet, huh? Uh, makes the devil fish look like a sardine can. Well, you better fall in love with her quick. First patrol's in two weeks. Great! Come on, let me show you around. This way. <sighs> Magnificent, isn't she? These fleet submarines are a new breed. Range, speed, maneuverability, everything. And maybe 40% of her effectiveness wasted on lousy torpedoes. What, they haven't replaced the Mark 14s yet? Nope, and the damn magnetic exploders are still failing. So I'm just gonna have to jam her in close and shoot for contact. Makes life interesting for all hands. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Hey, listen, I got a great idea. You know, I'm staying with Janice. Mm -hmm. Why don't you come by for dinner tonight? I'm sure she'd love to see you. Maybe some other time, all right? Here, let me show you the forward torpedo room. Hello? Jan, it's Byron. Byron. Listen, I got bad news. I won't be home for dinner tonight. I've got the watch. Oh, that's too bad. Everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. Good. Well, listen, I'll see you and Vic first thing in the morning. We'll be looking for you, especially Vic. It's only been one day, and already he's asking for his Uncle Briny. <laughs> That's great. Give him a hug for me. I gotta go. Will do. Bye. Honey, I hate to say this, but the hanky-panky's gonna have to stop for a while. What are you talking about? Just can't take a chance on Byron finding out about us. Janice, you're a grown woman. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing here. I know that. But you know Byron, and I don't want him to get all upset and disapproving. Can't have that. Am I understanding you? Are you calling it off? Oh? Would you mind all that much? Hell yes, I would. I hope Tom looks so tragic. Smile. Byron doesn't have to know. He'll have the duty. Every, every other night. I suppose you will, as long as you have anything to say about it. We'll see. Byron must never, ever find out about us. Janice, it's none of his business. <laughs>
Casablanca, January 24th, 1943. Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill meet secretly to map the Allied war strategy for the coming year. Mr. Prime Minister, would you say that uh, in view of Stalingrad, El Alamein and Guadalcanal and our landings here in North Africa, that we have turned the corner in this war? I have never promised anything but blood, toil, tears and sweat. Now, however, uh, we have a new experience, a bright gleam has caught the helmets of our soldiers and warmed and cheered all our hearts. And now, uh, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is, perhaps, uh, the end of the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, what can you tell us of the joint decisions that have been taken here? Precious little. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say this. Some of you Britishers know that we had a general named U.S. Grant. He was called Unconditional Surrender Grant. Well, the elimination of German, Italian, and Japanese war power means the unconditional surrender of Germany, Italy, and Japan. I associate myself with that completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. President, doesn't this unconditional surrender give the dictators a propaganda tool to prolong the war? I will answer that. A negotiation with Hitler are impossible. He's a maniac. But with supreme power to play out his hand to the end, which he will. Therefore, so will we. Unconditional surrender, gentlemen. Nothing less. Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President. Mr. Hmm. Unconditional surrender. Oh, pompous rubbish. It is the biggest mistake Roosevelt has ever made. <laughs> Dr. Goebbels will certainly have a field day with that one. In my opinion, there is only one propagandist in the world who is shrewder than Dr. Goebbels. Uh -huh. Who is that? Franklin Roosevelt. Do not any of you gentlemen realize what a masterstroke this is? With just two words, two sledgehammer words, which are even now ringing around the world, he has announced that we are losing the war. And to forestall any possibility of a separate peace in the East, he has publicly assured Stalin that the Allies are in it to the end. Field Marshal von Manstein's Operation Winter Storm, the relief of Fortress Stalingrad, has failed. But Hitler stubbornly clings to his stand-or-die policy. Paulus to Führer. Troops without ammunition or food. 18,000 wounded. No dressings or medicine. Further defense senseless. Collapse inevitable. Request immediate permission to surrender to save lives. Surrender forbidden. Six Army's heroic endurance to the last man will be the salvation of the Western world. Paulus to Führer. Fortress can be held only a few days longer. I shall order breakout and organize groups to the southwest. Breakouts forbidden. You will hold your positions to the last man and the last round. Send this. Paulus to Viva. Final collapse, a matter of hours. You will 
send this to General Paulus, Führer to Paulus. You are promoted to Feld Marshal. My congratulations. List of 117 of your officers, also promoted one grade, is as follows. Chief of Staff, Major General Schmidt. Schmidt. Congratulations, General Leutnant. And may I be the first to congratulate you, Feldmarschall. He didn't commit suicide! soldiers died for him. A hundred thousand became prisoners of the Bolsheviks. That doesn't upset him. Paulus didn't shoot himself. That upsets him. Somebody always has to be wrong. But he never is. Die Schlacht um Stalingrad ist beendet. Unter der beispielhaften Führung von Feldmarschall Paulus kämpfte unsere tapfere 6. Armee bis zum letzten Atemzug. Sie wurde von der Überzahl des Feindes durch die herrschenden, unvorteilhaften Umstände überwältigt. Ich hab Einen Kameraden, einen Besseren findest du nicht. Die Trommel Nun spricht zu Ihnen Reichspropagandaminister Dr. Josef Goebbels. Heil Hitler! Auf Befehl des Führers folgt eine viertägige Wolkstra. Alle Theater, Lichtspielhäuser und Vergnügungslokale sind ab sofort geschlossen. In Gedanken an den gefallenen Helden von Stalingrad. Heil Hitler! You predicted it, Halder. That was why he fired you. There's only one way to save Germany now. Kill him. Agreed. But 
How? And who will do it? I will. Count Klaus Schenk von Stauffenberg, scion of ancient German Catholic nobility, career army officer. It is he who will take upon himself the task of assassinating Adolf Hitler. Seven days later, on the other side of the world, Hitler's axis sustains another staggering blow. The Battle of Guadalcanal comes to an end. Six months and two days after the bloody battle began, Major General Alexander Patch, Commander Ground Forces Guadalcanal, sends a final communique to his superiors. Message for Admiral Halsey. Thank you. General Patch, good news. Total and complete defeat of Japanese forces effective at 1625 today. I'm happy to report Tokyo Express no longer has terminus Guadalcanal. Congratulations. On these two poles of war, Stalingrad and Guadalcanal, the Second World War turns. This is Halsey speaking. Get me General Patch. Both battles begin and end within days of each other. Both are desperate head-on clashes of national wills. Alex, Bill Halsey. <laughs> Foro, Foro, Alex. And with both outcomes and the Axis defeat in North Africa, the tide of war shifts for all the world to witness. But for Adolf Hitler, it marks the end of his dream of world conquest. After Stalingrad, he will only be fighting to save his neck. Guadalcanal, Henry. What's the reaction from the Kremlin, sir? Well, it's hard to say. From all we can make out, the Politburo hasn't sobered up since the Red Army kicked those heinies out of Stalingrad. <laughs> oh, I'm sure glad you're here, though. Yes, sir. I'm still not quite sure why I'm here. Well, I'll straighten you out on that. The whole purpose of your presence in Moscow is to get through to your old buddy, Yavlenko. You remember Yavlenko, don't you? Uh, yes, sir. Good. Well, he's Mr. Big on Lend-Lease now. He won't give the time of day to anybody, let alone meet with him. That's why I'm counting on you. Well, I'll do my best, sir. Just what sort of action do you want me to get out of General Yavlanko? A little quid pro quo, Henry. Something in return for all that Lend-Lease you've been giving him free gratis and for nothing on a silver platter. Here, take a look at what it says on that. Can you beat it? The Fellow Workers' Party of New York. Well, those are Lend-Lease or Red Cross cigarettes. They can't be anything else. Giving them to the Red Army by the millions. How did you get them, sir? Well, a Czech, Czech diplomat came into me last night, said he got them from a, a Red Army officer. Told him the fellow communist comrades in New York are supplying the whole Red Army. Well, let me tell you something. I got a bunch of reporters coming in here in about 10 minutes and they're gonna get one hell of an earful. Admiral, the uh, new Lend-Lease Act is coming up for a vote this week. I'm not sure that this is the time to bring something like this up. This is exactly the right time. That's what I want you to tell you, Franco. That those scoundrels know what ingratitude can lead to when you deal with the American people. This is pretty low-level stuff. I wouldn't magnify it out of proportion. You wouldn't, huh? Well, stick around. You know, boys, ever since I've been here, I've been waiting for some acknowledgments from the Russians that they're getting help from us and the British. 
Now, I don't mean only lend lease. I mean Red Cross and Russian Relief. My God, my wife works for Russian Relief, and not one whisper. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, we just came up from the southern front, and we see lots of Lend-Lease stuff in use. That's not what I said. I said some acknowledgments that the Soviets are fighting this war with our military supplies. Apparently, they want to cover up the fact that they're getting outside help. They want their people at home to believe that the Red Army's fighting this war alone. You sure this isn't off the record, Mr. Ambassador? No, use it. The Soviet authorities are apparently trained to convince those at home and abroad that they're fighting this war alone with their own resources. I see no reason why you shouldn't print wire box if you care to. Mr. Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador please. <laughs> to read about your engagement. I didn't realize you were still in Washington. Well, I'll be moving on soon. Probably to Moscow. Moscow. We should probably see Pug. Very possibly. Well, if you do, don't forget to remind him to watch his weight. He absolutely balloons when he's not at sea. I'll be sure and mention it. Well, it's been my pleasure, Peters, Mrs. Henry, but I'm afraid Pamela and I have to show the flag at another party this evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, there's big brass for you. Fern Wilkes was just given a China Burma India theater. You don't say. It's a very attractive couple. She's looking much older. Shall we dance? I'd love to. Thanks for seeing me, General. It's good to see you again. Not at all, Captain Henry. I remember well our last time together. See. Si. Ah. 
Ay, 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 ay. As I understand it, your ambassador seeks a general statement on the use of land lease materials on the battlefields. Land lease is very costly. Our president needs popular support if it is to continue. But haven't victories like Stalingrad gained enough public support? We are a grateful people, Captain Henry. We show it by fighting. What else would you have us do? Still, my ambassador feels that there's been insufficient publicity on American and Allied aid. Huh? <laughs> uh, you toured the front at a bad moment in 1941. Well, by a pleasant coincidence, I can offer you another such trip. I'm about to leave Moscow to inspect the uh, land lease situation in the battlefield. I will visit active fronts. There may be hazards. You wish to accompany me and render an eyewitness report to uh, your president? That can be arranged. And perhaps we can then agree on a general statement as well. I accept. When do we start? <laughs> Vodka! When we make a start. American style. So. Captain. Bash is that over here. Tomorrow. We'll probably go to Leningrad first. It is still under attack, but uh, there are ways through that are not uh, too dangerous. the Germans shell the tracks? Constantly, and we keep fixing them. It is called the Corridor of Death. <laughs> but we will not be going into the city that way today. No. We are traveling over the ice in one of the truck convoys. Vladia! <laughs> <laughs> But they can't really see us. It's too far away. Their sense of smell is not too bad. I hope these trucks float. <laughs> Up over to sea. Also, the boots and the uniforms of this battalion. Do they know what they're wearing? Maurice, at an old Так точно, товарищ генерал. Пошито в Америке. Очень хороший материал. Хорошее обмундирование, товарищ генерал. Also, Russian body. <laughs> I don't see any destruction. No. 
Not here. It's a beautiful city. It was. Now I will show you what the Germans have done to the rest of our city. Before a siege, Leningrad was a city of three million people. Now, 600,000. Captain Victor Gedry, American yet, Nash Ghost. What's in Priyatno? My daughter in law here invites us to her apartment. Люди ели тогда странные вещи: кожаные ремни, обойный клей, собак, кошек, даже крыс, мещей, воробьев. Больница рассказывали жуткие истории. Я приготовила их с опилками из вазолина. Ужасно. Вот это тошнило, но хотя бы что-то было в животе. Выдавался кусочек хлеба, я все маме давала. Ты бландас, урмейд. Крут, штупит, конфракетовал бландас. Пойду. Million old people, children, and, and others who were not able-bodied should have been evacuated. With the Germans uh, 150 kilometers away and bombers coming around the clock. Food should not have been stored in old warehouses. Six months ration for the whole city. Burned up in one night. Burned up! But the Germans did not take any. And they will not. Moscow gave the orders. But Leningrad saved itself despite the orders. Captain Gennery не хочет слушать про такие печальные вещи. Если вас это огорчает, тогда другое дело. Но мне интересно. Ну, может быть, потом. Сейчас поедим. That is my son. Fine-looking young man. I believe you told me you have an Aviarta son. It did. He was killed in the Battle of Midway. His name? Warren. So, Mr. Hopkins, with regard to the question of a separate peace, on which you have specifically asked for my judgment, at this point, such a peace would be a betrayal. And when I'm among the Russians, I don't sense or fear that kind of treachery. Lend-lease is an inspired and historic policy. But blood shed on the battlefield remains the decisive thing in wars, and people can stand only so much of it without hope of relief. My crystal ball, therefore, says something very obvious. 
If we can convince the Russians that we're serious about a second front in Europe soon, we can forget about a separate peace. Otherwise, it's a risk. Sincerely, Victor Henry. Stalin, Leningrad, all those other rusty cities you've been to. Boy, you have covered some ground. I bet those boys in the foreign office have their noses out of joint. Outstanding, Pug. Admiral, I'm the beneficiary of a delusion that around here I'm somebody. You are somebody. Let me have that report, the soonest. <clears throat> you know, Pug, my, uh, my head may still roll from that press conference I gave, but by God, it worked. I beg your pardon, Admiral. Haven't you heard? There's been a rash of Lee stories in the Soviet press. That and your old buddy Yavlenko has finally come around with those statements I've been after. My God, they'll think twice before kicking us around anymore. Admiral, they're putting up a magnificent fight along a thousand-mile front. They're breaking Nazi Germany's back, and they're suffering horribly. There's your quid pro quo. Yeah, yeah. Hey, how about the Germans retaking Harkov? That confounded maniac Hitler's got nine lives. You, you ought to have seen the down-in-the-mouth Ruskies at the Swedish embassy last night. <laughs> See you later, bud. Dear Captain Henry, the Washington Moscow pouch is a handy thing. I have some news for you and a request. First, the request. Pam Tudsbury is here, as you know, working for the London Observer. She wants to go to Moscow, where indeed all the major war stories are to be found these days. She applied for a visa some time ago, but no soap. Quite simply, can you do something about this? When I suggested to Pam she writes you, she turned colors and said, no chance. Wouldn't dream of pestering you. I told Pamela I would write you about her, and she turned more flamboyant colors and said, Leslie, don't you dare. I won't hear of it. I took that as British female double talk for, oh, please, please do. Now I come to the news. The attempt to get Natalie and her uncle out of Lourdes fell through. The matter of the 40 aircraft is discussed on pages 17 and 18. And here is my lend-lease summary. Thank you. I will not be able to read your report now. I am off to the southern front. I will read it on the plane. General, I have also written a personal letter to Harry Hopkins. I uh, don't want to leave a copy with you, but uh, if you'd care to read it and hand it back, I will wait. That is the kind of cautious secrecy you Russians are often accused of. Possibly it's infectious. As I told you, Captain Henry, unfortunately, I have very little time now. In that case, uh, when you return, I'll be at your service. Savo, minor two. If you have any comments, I'll uh, transmit them to Mr. Hopkins. You may not like what I have to say. That doesn't matter. Your talk of a separate peace is provocative and naive. Now I must go. You asked about my son on the Harkov front. We have heard from him. He is all right. I am absolutely delighted to hear that. As for Miss Pamela Tudsbury, her visa has been issued. Your drive will return you to your flat. Goodbye.
A Jew's Journey, February the 20th, 1943. It has been some time since I have felt well enough to make an entry into this journal. Shortly after our arrival here in Baden-Baden, almost two months ago, I began to suffer from severe gastric problems. And just last week, I became so ill that our American doctor, a Red Cross man, requested my hospitalization. After every conceivable gastrointestinal examination, the diagnosis is an ailment known as diverticulitis. And the treatment, a special diet, bed rest, and continuous medication. This morning, for the first time since I left the hospital, I'm at last feeling a little better. You're not overdoing it. Aren't you chilly? No, 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 I'm fine, my dear. Fit as fit as a boy. Mm. All those hospital jellies and custards must have done me good, I think. We heard the latest rumors about our exchange. Now it's supposed to take place at Easter. Yeah. The Germans showing their civilized respect for religion, I suppose. Well, we shall see. Aaron? Aaron, what is it? God! Look here, Mrs. Henry. You can just see the developing lesions in the intestinal wall. I'm afraid it will require surgery, but unfortunately, we don't have the facilities here. Then what do we do? Paris, Mrs. Henry. The best men for such surgery is in the American hospital in Paris. This is Byron Henry. Yes. Uh, War Lissel, Swiss Mission. Uh, Henri Bully in Baden Baden, I send me your files. I'll be your Swiss contact in Paris. Are we safe here, Mr. Lissel? Oh, yes. Try not to worry. There are several special case Americans like yourself in Paris uh, waiting for the exchange. We'll get the guns for you today. Oh, thank you. Yes. Oui, professeur Aaron Jansrud. Ah, de la part de l'ambassadeur d'Allemagne. Ah, de la part de Otto Abetz lui-même. Oui, vous constatez que Otto Abetz souhaite que le professeur reçoive les soins les plus efficaces possibles. Mmh. Une lettre extrêmement curieuse, surtout étant donné les circonstances actuelles. Et vous remarquez que les autorités d'occupation, dans ce cas présent, estiment que les problèmes ratio ne doit pas être pris en considération. De toute évidence, les préjugés de race ne passent pas la porte d'un hôpital. Comte, may I present Mrs. Byron Henry, Professor Jastrow's niece. Mrs. Henry, Comte Aldebert de Chambre, and director of this hospital. I'm honored. Monsieur. Merci, Comte. Monsieur m'a l'air extrêmement fatigué. Menez-le à sa chambre. I'm taking them to your room now. I'll see you later. Madame Dufer can relieve you of any burdens. Thank you, but my only concern is for my uncle. When is he to be operated on? The surgery is scheduled for 8 o'clock tomorrow morning.
There have been complications, Madame Henry. You have some bad days, yes, but he should do fine. I'm afraid he will be some time recuperating. But when we can move him, he will have a splendid sunny room with a terrace for his recovery, as well as round-the-clock nursing. Well, of course. I'm taking a personal interest in your uncle, madam, and will keep you informed. I don't know how to thank you, Count. Good morning. You must be Natalie, the niece. Girard, mettez-le sur la petite commode et la table là. But you're every bit as lovely as my husband said you were. Your husband? Oh, I'm the Comtesse de Chambre. <laughs> my, we're a long way from home, aren't we, little britches? <laughs> you were an American? I was. Your uncle, the author, I take it. Mm -hmm. I'm a Longworth. I'm related to the Roosevelt's by marriage. Of course, we can't count that man in the White House right now. Some kind of a throwback is what I make of him. Well, one can't choose one's relatives, can one? Except by marriage, which is how I'm related to Pierre Laval. Our son married his daughter, a lovely, frail little thing. But did I mention that? No, I don't think you did. Well, he'll be the savior of France, that's what. That the Allies flock to de Gaulle utterly amazes me. Nothing but a posturing charlatan with that horrendous nose. <coughs> The statement that France lost a battle, and not the war, is irresponsible rubbish. Why don't you join me in my husband's office for a cup of tea? There's something I'd like to discuss with you. I know, it tastes like boiled grass. It's verbena tea. It works miracles for the digestion. Anyway, there isn't any other kind to be had. Your uncle seems very ill indeed. He almost died of internal hemorrhaging. Oh, dear me. My husband says he won't be able to return to Baden-Baden for some time. Now then, the Comte tells me you're Radcliffe with a Sorbonne graduate degree. Yes, in another lifetime. Don't be soppy. As it happens, I manage the American library. The girls who helped me all went home when the Bosch got on the march. How would you like to do something useful? Oh, I'd love it. But what about my son? I'll arrange for someone to take care of little Yankee Doodle. Well, then it's all settled. You'll work for me. By the way, where are you staying? I found a boarding house. A boarding house? Absolutely unacceptable. The hospital provides perfectly adequate lodging for its staff close by, and there'll be more than enough room for you and the boy. We'll go take care of that right now, and you'll come to work for me at the library. You're terribly kind. Nonsense. I want to get back to writing on my book about the clowns in Hamlet and Macbeth. I'm a Shakespeare scholar. Of sorts. April in Paris. I had my first love in Paris. In April, a long time ago. It's the only time and place. All these German uniforms ruin everything. One soon stops noticing them. One soon doesn't notice those yellow stars either. Never, not me. Well. If the British hadn't left us in the lurch at Dunkirk, you wouldn't be seeing that in Paris now. Unfortunately, my dear, that Churchill is nothing more than a drunken loudmouth. Come, let's have lunch. Another side I'll never get used to, the Champs-Élysées. Believe me, 
The Bosch are a lot better than the Bolsheviks. If only Hitler had the sense not to invade France and to finish off Russia instead, he would have been a world hero today. Now, we have to wait for the Americans to rescue us. So, Natalie, is your uncle pleased with the nice sunny garden suite in our convalescent home? He's a bit dazed by the luxury and, and all the good treatment. As am I. Why is that? You know the occupiers requested it. I know. I wake up nights worrying about that. My child, what nonsense. There's nothing in the least strange about it. After the exchange, your uncle will no doubt be talking to newspapers and magazines about his treatment at German hands. This is a chance for them to counter the unfavorable opinion they've been getting on their Jewish policy. So you really think it's just a propaganda ploy? My dear, the Germans are a coarse and thick-headed lot. But they display a certain brutish cunning when it comes to propaganda. That Dr. Goebbels is quite clever in his heavy-handed way. In any event, what other explanation can there be? friend of yours. to see you again. 